Hello and welcome to the second Adventure Films podcast. The last one we did was the 1933 um, King Kong film and this is the second of, of the ten films we're doing, um, ten adventure films, and this is The Man Who Would Be King, uh, the 1975 John Huston film. Um, and just to recap briefly, um, a few weeks ago I came up with ten of my favourite adventure films, um, and really we were just, we're just doing um, a podcast audio discussion about each of those films. Um, so I'm Garen Ewing, um, I'm uh, an author and illustrator of an adventure comic called The Rainbow Orchid and um, I'm doing this with my brother Murray Ewing. Hello I'm Murray, um, I suppose uh, my main interest in this is I, I write, um, I'm mainly interested in fantasy and science fiction and that sort of thing but uh, uh, in this podcast we're straying outside that I suppose. Yeah, so this is the first... This film is very much a... To get straight into it, this is a straight-up adventure, yes. isn't it? I mean, this mm. is really... I tried to define what adventure films, and you can listen to the first one to see me um, struggling with that definition. <laughs> but this is really what I call a very straightforward, classic, really kind of almost the pure stuff yeah. <laughs> adventure. Um, man against nature, going on a, a quest into the unknown. And it really feels though it could actually have happened. Yes, um, I mean, it's based on the Rudyard Kipling short story uh, written in 1888. Um, and in fact, now there are slight differences between the short story and the film. And I, I guess we'll probably talk about some of those. But we're mainly concentrating on the film, on all of these, we're talking about the film. And again, as I said on the King Kong one, we're not film historians. We don't have a ton of you know necessarily high accurate facts <laughs> at our fingertips we'll try our best um but really we're talking about adventure stories um and and really the story aspect of it mostly we obviously we're interested in the film side and the little facts and figures as well which we'll we'll i'm sure we'll pepper this with and, and get a few wrong as well i'm sure <laughs> um this is one of two John Houston films on our list. And oh, in fact, it? the next one we're doing, I think it's the next one, is The Treasure of the Sierra Madre, which is John Houston as well. Oh, I didn't know that. And there's some themes, I think. But <laughs> we'll those. So this is set in India in, I think, um, about 1887. Um, and the basic story is you've got these two uh, adventuring mavericks, Daniel Dravet and Peachy Carnahan, um, they're, they're ex-army and what, I think one of the important things about their character is that they are working class pretty much I think that's, mm -hmm. that's pretty sure um, and they've come over to India and they've really started to live they've, they've started to experience freedom they've left the army but they haven't left India cause and they, I'll just say something um, this film is informed by quite a lot of my another interest, a passion I've got for the second Anglo-Afghan War, which was 1878 to 80, and that's referred to a few times in these films. I'm going to get a bit nerdy on that later, <laughs> these facts, but um, British soldiers earned more in India, their money went further, yeah. and quite often they didn't want to go back to England mm -hmm. um, because where they'd be poor, and in fact he says in the film um, we'd end up as... Just they'd end up as porters, yeah. pretty much. No, in fact, we have um, our own ancestors, <laughs> great 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 uncles who served in the uh, great 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 uncles served in the Second Anglo Afghan War, came back from India and worked as um, well, one was a porter for really? a railways, uh, and the other was actually a timekeeper for the railway, a little bit better. Yeah. Um, but a lot in my research, I know a lot of soldiers came back to yeah. pretty mundane jobs. They very rarely, I think, went back to the um, trades that they started off in, which yeah. weren't usually weren't very high anyway, labourers, yeah. stable grooms and things, because obviously they were quite young, um, sometimes running away to join the army. And this was a life, especially when you went to India, although it had all the dangers of disease 
uh, tropical, well maybe not tropical, but um, you know, cholera and heat stroke, which is quite dangerous, uh, and lots of uh, sexual diseases. From yeah. if you look at the um, medical files of a lot of these men, uh, yeah. a lot of it is uh, gonorrhea and, and uh, all kinds yeah. of other things. Um, but yes, going back to England was mm-hmm. not necessarily something they wanted to do. That uh, a lot of men rejoined, extended their service yeah. just to stay in India. Which is quite a contrast if you think about it to the First and Second World Wars, where there was no option to stay out there because you were fighting in. A very different sort of country and they probably just wanted to get home whereas this one if you didn't really have a family to come to you could there was a sense that you could make your fortune you could become a absolutely well as in this film you could become a king that's the <laughs> <laughs> kings of Kafiristan. could you become one? yeah i mean there's i thought about this um i mean again this is in relation perhaps to the next film which is uh, a bit of the wild west this is kind of the um i don't know if you call it the wild um, near east, uh, but <laughs> yes. the wild west, northwestern frontier, perhaps um, very similar. It's all, it's almost a, a British western. Um, John Houston was American, of course, but it was mainly a British crew. Yes. Um, so um, yes, we were talking about the plot. So we've got these two soldiers, mm. and um, they're a bit of duckers and divers. Yeah. Um, and basically, they decide to make their fortune by going off into Kafiristan, which is an unexplored by white men, we get mm-hmm. that phrase again that was in King Kong um, country, uh, north of Afghanistan, where they feel they can, with their superior, with their civilised brains and uh, 20 martini rifles, yes. they uh, will be able to work, um, you know, um, take over the tribes and become kings of Kafiristan. Now, I assumed from watching this that Kafiristan is a made-up country. No. <laughs> Kafiristan um, at that time did exist. Oh, really? um, k- kafir means an unbeliever, so really? a non Muslim, basically, an unbeliever in relation to the oh. um, Islamic faith. Um, and it was called Kafiristan. Um, in, now, this is set in 1887. I think in the 1890s, the British um, uh, left Afghanistan with a new emir. Uh, Abdurrahman, right? Um, who had been looked, he'd been a, a guest of the Russians throughout the war. But <laughs> um, by the end of the war, the British wanted to get out, so he was the best candidate, the one they wanted anyway, the one they felt would be most friendly towards them. And he actually was fairly uniting influence. But one of the things he did in the eighteen nineties, so say, um, yeah, maybe a little less than ten years after this film set, mm. is he converted the kafirs into believers oh. and uh, Kafiristan became Nuristan the enlightened country so from the <laughs> uh, Kafiristan is the um, land of the unbelievers Nuristan is the enlightened land oh, uh, enlightened right, land right. Um, so yes it did exist um, uh, uh, and certainly Kipling was writing about a real place oh. so the two main characters as I said are Daniel Dravet played by Sean Connery and Peachy Carnahan, played by Michael Caine. The other main character, who's the narrator, is Rudyard Kipling himself in the film, um, played by Christopher Plummer. Yes. With a very authentic moustache. Yes. <laughs> and he looks just, quite good, actually. Whenever you see photos of Kipling, he's got this long moustache. George reminds me of a paintbrush. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yes. It really goes there. You know, it's really uh, um, bushy. Peter O'Toole <laughs> was almost uh, there to play... Christopher Pl- um, to play Rudyard Kipling. Really? Um, and I'll talk about um, John Houston originally had the idea to make this film in the early 50s, I think 1952. Back then, he'd sort of made Bogart a huge star. Oh. So his two leads then were Humphrey Bogart and Clark Gable. <laughs> you imagine that. Um, that didn't happen. Bogart died, then Clark Gable died um, in the 60s, I think. And so I think. Someone also said that Burt Lancaster and Kirk Douglas were candidates. I'm not so sure huh. about that. Definitely Paul Newman and Robert Redford were candidates. Wow. Um, maybe in the early 70s. Um, uh, Paul Newman, I think, was the one who suggested that he should get two British... Yes. <laughs> thank goodness. <laughs> people to play British soldiers. I mean, can you imagine Bogart and Gable uh, yeah, playing it, it, it? I can't imagine it. They're, they wouldn't th- change their accents to British accents. No, no. I just they they have to change it. It would have to. I mean, if, if he kept them as British soldiers, I think it'd be ridiculous. So perhaps you can imagine that it would be rewritten to make mm. them um, a couple of American adventures yeah. or something. Um, 
But I think Paul Newman suggested um, Sean Connery and Michael Caine, and oh. I can't imagine anyone else in those roles. No, I think they these two people really make the film. I think there are certain moments in the film I noticed that really are carried just by the acting. Yeah, I don't tend to notice acting usually, no. but I think it's there. It, yeah. In fact, I think John Huston said to Sean Connery, uh, to hit Connery and Kane, they're one character. When they're together, oh. they can do anything. Yeah. <laughs> um, and that's true. Things go wrong when they split yes, yeah. towards the end. Well, we'll yeah. get to that, of course. Because um, there's one other casting decision I noticed. The woman who plays Roxanne. Yes. Shakira Kane. Yes. Michael Kane's <laughs> wife. Yeah. I wonder if they were married before or yes. during. <laughs> they were married before. Oh right. Um, Shakira Kane um, is of Islamic Indian descent, and I think she lived, was born in uh, uh, well South America somewhere. Oh right. Uh, is it Guy- Guyana or something? And um, yeah, Michael Kane had seen her. She was mm. a model, and oh, thought, yeah. decided to track her down mm. and uh, married her. But so interestingly, that's the only film they've appeared together in, Shakira oh. Kane and Michael Kane. Um, and the film was not filmed in India, it was filmed in Morocco. Oh. Um, and uh, Sean Connery met his current, and his second wife and current wife there, oh. uh, who's a Moroccan artist, I think. Um, so wives, wives <laughs> <laughs> feature. Um, the other great character in this film is uh, Billy Fish, yes. uh, played by <laughs> Saeed Jeffrey who a lot of British listeners will probably... He's been quite a lot of Indian-based yeah. British dramas. I definitely recognised him. Yeah, He's brilliant. And he's such a great character. And he's a creation of John Houston because Billy Fish, the Gurkha, does not appear in... Have you read the short story? No, I didn't get around to it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I read it a while ago, and then I, I read it um, a few weeks ago when I knew we were going to be doing this, just to remind myself. Um, Billy Fish is in the story, but he's not a Gurkha. Oh. He's... Um, He's probably Uttar, the chief, except in the book, um, the chieftain doesn't get killed and have his head played right. as a, used as a polo ball. Yeah. Um, he stays loyal to Peachy and Carnahan throughout the whole thing, mm. uh, like Billy Fish, the Gurkha, does in this. Yeah. But, of course, uh, we needed a translator. Yes. Um, but he's such a great character and with his sort of Indian English <laughs> uh, which is so hilarious. I mean, it's, it's, it's true as well. Yeah, um, uh, it's brilliant. I love that kind of stuff. This film does have quite a few comic moments coming from the acting. I think yeah. Billy Fish is one of the and these ones. kind of the kind of um, the the British assuming how great they are, they can yeah. walk over. I mean that that kind of um, uh, arrogance. Arrogance is the word yeah. I was looking for. Um, it, I, it's not. It comes. I mean, they're, they're sending it up slightly, I think, in the film, yeah. as it should be, perhaps. But it's it doesn't offend. It's no. it's just hilarious. Certainly, it's probably authentic for the times. Yeah, oh, very much so. Yeah. Very much so. <laughs> uh, when Billy Fish appears, he mm. says um, he was part of Colonel Robertson's mm. geographical expedition, completely separately in my Afghan war research. Well, I've got. To, I'm going to explain. The man who would be king. Um, dovetails two of my oh. things the Afghan war yeah and also in the Rainbow Orchid volume three I did a lot of research on the Kalasha tribe hmm. oh yes um, yeah. and they were and are kafirs um, pro- possibly the only kafir tribe left in the northwest frontier area they're near oh, Chitral right. Be- they they escaped the um, Abdurrahman um, conversions yeah. by being within um, a British um, controlled area near oh. Chitral yeah. and Abdurrahman wasn't going to go that far because the British so kind of thanks to the British colonialism uh, the Kalash are still thriving it's, well it's not preserved, thriving preserved. there's about 3,000 of them <laughs> yeah. left they're, they're actually they are a um, uh, an endangered tribe if you like and yeah. they're slowly are losing their numbers to being converted to yeah. to yeah. Um, Islam. Um, so, in my research into the Kalasha, mm. I learnt about um, oh yeah, George Scott Robertson, um, who, and I bought his book, um, The Kafirs of the Hindu Kush, because he spent a year, he was one of the f- first people to go into Kafiristan, 
<laughs> and study the tribes there. Yeah. So Robertson was a real person. Oh. He did not die in an avalanche, as is mentioned in this film. And they've used the real person and said, oh, yeah, the mountain fell on his head. <laughs> I was the only, and they were buried alive. I was the only survivor, Billy Fish yeah. says. Um, yeah. Robertson actually survived. Uh, well, I don't know if there was an avalanche. Um, but certainly... Now, that that's interesting. The Kafirs of the Hindu Kush was written, published. He was there uh, 1890-ish. Oh. And it was published in 1896. So both his trip and the book were after Kipling's mm. story so Kipling it wasn't um, an influence on Kipling yes anyway that's Billy Fish uh, the Gurkhas were in the Afghan war as well they were mm. they were they covered themselves in glory in that yeah, campaign fa- famously fierce fighters yes yeah. yeah as we see at the end when Billy Fish rushes into the yes with his <laughs> um, uh, what's the knife called is it it's not a kukri is it I can't remember is it a kukri I can't remember <laughs> Uh, the Gurkha knife and the war cry that um, Joanna Lumley has been shouting <laughs> recently. <laughs> Just something that started me thinking about this film in a slightly different way to probably you think about it is the is the beginning where we get um, Michael Caine's character coming to see Rudyard Kipling, and this is after the adventure has happened. It's a sort of preface to the film, but it's a after the adventure has happened. Device. Yes. <laughs> so, um, what's his name? Peachy comes along and he's unrecognisable from how he was when Kipling last saw him. He he's he's uh, he looks like a beggar. Yeah, an Indian like a, be- an Indian beggar. Yeah, almost like a leper, and he looks a lot older. And in fact, he says that uh, once Kipling has recognised him, he says, "Oh, that was a thousand years ago." When he's talking about before they went to Kafiristan. Yes, yeah, possibly a year ago. Yeah, it just seems like an awful long time, but this started me thinking about um, tales of people who disappear into fairyland. Oh, right, yeah. Which is, of course, quite famously, uh, they go there and time um, passes at a different rate. And so you get tales like Rip Van Winkle, as he goes to sleep. But people go to fairyland, think they spend a day there and come back and find years have passed and everyone they knew is old. Yeah. And this is sort of like that. They, um, Peachy and um, Danny Dravitt do disappear into a sort of fairyland. There are other parts of the film which sort of <coughs> tie up with this. Uh, and they come back completely changed, unrecognisable, as if they've been through thousands of years where you know the outside world has only been through one year. Yeah. So that's what I thought when we see peachy come along one of them comes back very different a yes lot short, a lot shorter <laughs> there will be spoilers in this by the way yeah um yes at uh, the the beginning of the film i think is fantastic and isn't yes. in the book so the whole setup um of i mean they do meet on a train yeah and he does say could you make your trip eight days instead of ten and go to marwa junction i'm probably getting these names wrong marwa junction and pass a message yes um there is that, but the bit that's made up is, I think, I remember this right, is is the um, Peachy steals Kipling's watch. watch. Yeah. Realises that the watch uh, chain has a fob on it showing the Masonic mark, so yeah. sees he's a fellow Mason. Yeah. And um, follows him onto the train to return the watch. Yeah. Um, and that's how they meet. That's how he... And, and, of course, that fob is important later on. Yeah. The Masonic symbol... Um, because when the high priest in the in the city sees it, they're about to stab Dravet for for not being a god. When they open his um, top and s- his his army jacket and see that fob around his mm. neck, they realise it's the symbol of their god Imbra. Yeah. Um, or or the the symbol that Alexander left them anyway. Yes. And at the beginning of the film, um, Kipling does say that some people have traced the Masons back. To Solomon's the times of, yeah, Solomon's Temple, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, in the book, there's no watch fob, but they are Masons, and Dravot recognises that the Kafirs know the first two degrees of Masonic oh, really? um, uh, ritual. Um, so that's how they become gods to them. Oh. And they are able to teach them the third degree, I think, and, and oh. so that puts them ahead of them. And he wears, he gets out his Masonic... Um, uh, overall, <laughs> right. probably the wrong word. <laughs> His robe. Masonic dungarees, <laughs> robe, <laughs> robe, uh, apron, whatever, um, yeah. and that's got the symbol on it. And that's when the priest sees it and overturns a rock and this forgotten symbol that only the priests know. And yeah. that 
um, solidifies them as gods in Kafiristan yes. in the book. Yeah. So very similar. Yeah. But, um, yeah. But so a great beginning, a great setup, and uh, Peachy and and Dravet then visit Kipling, and yeah. they sign it. They get to witness their contract. Yeah. Which is actually something like. 20 minutes into the film the first 20 minutes are just really establishing the characters of Peachy and Danny Dravid yeah as sort of reprobates which Kipling is quite you know he doesn't object to their their amoral amorality until he realises they're going to impersonate um, the correspondence from the northern star star and that's that's <laughs> so funny when he says that they're, they're going to blackmail um, a, uh, a Maharaja I think yeah and, and just as the train's pulling away, Kipling is saying to Dravid, but how are you going to... He's laughing at them, you know, how are you going to do that? And as the train pulls away and the steam's coming, um, Dravid says, oh, we're, go we're going to... We're going to say we're correspondents of the Northern, Northern Star. And suddenly Kipling's face changes. <laughs> you can't do that because I'm the... the, the uh, the, the correspondent to, and Dravid's going, pardon? <laughs> 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 it's brilliant. Yeah. Very but funny. Immediately after, he's... He's almost like an indulgent uncle, you know. He sort well, of smiles he, at all their silly plans. You yes, know? yes. He, he. I mean, he to save their own lives. It's not because they're impersonating yes. him, although that obviously does annoy him a bit. But he uh, shops them to the authorities, and that's another yes. funny scene where they marched in front of the governor or whatever yes. it is, and. Um, but Kipling doesn't want them arrested. He just wants to stop them. Yes, yeah. Doing this mad plan. <laughs> yeah. And immediately they come up with another, even more mad plan. <laughs> yes. Which is to go and make themselves kings of Kafiristan. And I noted down the quote. Actually, they say because this, I think, is the key of why they do it. And I think it brings up the feel of the times and brings the sort of really the sort of soul of the adventurous spirit of this film. The fact, the feel that you're in a place where you can achieve something by doing something you know you can really go for greatness you can become a king yes if you take the risk yes because they say um let me introduce you to brother peachy carnahan which is him and brother daniel dravert which is i the less said about our professions the better but we have been most things in our time we've been all over india we know her cities her jungles her jails and her palaces and we have decided that she isn't big enough for such as we. Yes, that's what I understood the commissioner to say. Therefore, we are going away to another place oh. where a man isn't crowded and can come into his own. We're not little men, so we're going away to be kings. Kings of Kafristan. And they dream of um, uh, being able to talk to the Viceroy of India on level terms and eventually, yeah. well, later when he realises he's a god, to, to actually <laughs> talk to Queen Victoria as a cousin, yes. I think is what he says. Which is the thing about war generally, that it does tend to break down class barriers. I mean, that's mm. the thing about the Second World War and the First World War, and I suppose this is true of this time. These people went to another country and saw how much richer and perhaps more powerful they were even as working class people compared to the people of yeah. India or potentially. It was the only place they could go and do that really. I mean, yeah. India, as they say at the beginning, as Peach says at the beginning of the film, he has a little rant about the bureaucrat yes, of yeah. India. And it was a very bureaucratic society. You had the mm. civil um, services and the military services, but it was really, I mean, it, it helped. It, it, it did, it you know, gave India its justice system and the railways and all that mm. and there, were, there was the good stuff and the bad stuff <clears throat> um, um, but there was a lot of bureaucracy yes. and this was to escape yeah, these, there's too, yeah. this is too small for them <laughs> India's too yeah. small for them they're going to a place with no laws so they can make their own laws I suppose is yes. the point yeah. to be kings yeah. but they do uh, draw up a contract between them mm. a contract which is, yeah contract <laughs> uh, which is which is quite a significant moment in the whole film because they say the two things they're definitely not going to do is indulge in women or drink. Yes. <laughs> and, of course, it's as soon as they, they cross that line. Two, two of the things that yeah. the pri privates, although I think they were non-commissioned officers, I think they were yes. sergeants, yeah. but, but so NCOs and privates in the British Army uh, was really a central part of the time in India was drink and really? uh, <laughs> <laughs> of course drink doesn't play a major part in the film neither no. of them gets drunk no no um, I mean you see the look Dravert gives as he takes his last shot of whiskey yes. before he signs the contract yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes but that's an important part I mean obviously the, the, the women 
the part yeah. is is the downfall. Yeah. Eventually. Um, but this is another part of my fairy tale theory about this <laughs> film, is that when you go into fairyland, there are often arbitrary laws that you're told not to break, such as don't eat the food, or if fairyland is hell, it's just like they say, don't look behind you as you're leaving. You know, they're arbitrary laws, but as soon as you break them, everything falls apart. Right. You know? yes. And that's true of this film as yes. well. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. The contract is really. As long as they'd have stuck to it, they'd have probably... Yeah, there's the feeling that once... And also, of course, it's when the friendship between them breaks down slightly. Mm. We'll, we'll come to that later, I suppose. Mm. Yeah. yeah, well. Um, so, um, once they've made the contract, they disguise themselves, Danny Dravot, as a <coughs> a mad uh, fortune teller. Yes. And, and Peachy, who can speak Urdu or Hindi or whatever he needs... Um, as his servant. Yeah. Uh, Javit doesn't have the language, so he's he completely just, crazy. Yeah, he's just mad and does a whirling dervish thing. Yeah, and they <laughs> hide their martinis in... Is it camels? or I think it's camels, though. Or is it horses? Mules. They get camels at first, but then they win some mules. Of course, they, they steal get the mules. Some mules <laughs> don't they? Yeah. So off they go through the Khyber Pass, and now I'm going to bring up some Afghan war questions. Right, go ahead. Which <laughs> will matter to no one watching this film. But um, they do say the last time they went through the Khyber Pass was when they were um, attacking Ali Masjid mm. and were covering were um, with Bobs, who's right. Lord Roberts. All right. And so this is an inaccuracy because General Roberts, who he his name was made by the Afghan War, didn't go through the Khyber Pass. <laughs> um, he went through um, the Quran Valley. So first of all, they wouldn't have been with Roberts at Ali Masjid. <laughs> um, and there's a little bit, you know, the private Mulvaney, who they um, is that his oh name? the the bloke on border patrol. Yes, who they throw the voice and he um, starts marching time. Yeah, um, he's from another Kipling story called Soldiers Three, <laughs> quite a famous Kipling character. Um, so that's a little in joke, oh. Kipling in joke. Um, I I think there's a few like on the train going back to on the train. Yeah. Um, Peachy says he, he asks him what regiment he's from yeah. and he says he's of from the I think it's something like the foreign fit mm. um, that's a fictional regiment that Kipling created for a story called the drums of the fore and aft I think that's what it's called <laughs> really which um, is also apparently loosely based on I mean they go that's a regiment that goes into Afghan Afghanistan and um, completely mucks up mm. and they're, they're um, a sort of regiment that's got a shame attached to their name right. so it could be about Maiwand which was an Afghan war disaster or some people think it's about a battle called Ali Kel yeah. so anyway Afghan another thing but yeah. anyway if he wasn't the forum fit also he wouldn't have been a fictional regiment but they would have been <laughs> at um, Ali Masjid just if you want to get these facts right, which yeah. <laughs> doesn't matter to anyone, as I say, uh, just little things. They may have been in another regiment. Yeah. But they chose the... Obviously, they wanted the Kipling thing. The forum fit is a is a Kipling thing, which is quite nice. <laughs> um, in the book, they say... So Kipling got it wrong as well. So that's in the film. In the book, they say they were with Roberts at Jagdalak. Yeah. Um, and Roberts, again, wasn't at Jagdalak because that's on the Khyber route. He, <laughs> was, he was further south. So Kipling got it wrong. Of course, there is a, an explanation of that because in the isn't the story being told to Kipling by Peachy, mm. and Peachy and Danny oh, Jones okay. are just <laughs> the sort of people to make up a lot. So they may have not even have been in the Afghan War. <laughs> well, no, I'm just saying that the sort of people who would involve themselves, you know, they would think that they were involved in every major thing that happened in That's India. That's an excellent <laughs> point, and I'm going to say something else about my Afghan War research. I get a lot of family history yeah. researchers write to me. And say, oh, I've even had photos of people with Afghan war medals and it turns out they weren't there. Mm. Now, there's not the majority of soldiers at all, but it was common enough that soldiers, once they got home to England from India, mm. where no one back to England, no one in England knew what happened out in India, they conjured up medals for themselves, they altered their <laughs> records. Um, <clears throat> there's a soldier who was celebrated in Australia in the 1930s as the oldest surviving British soldier. Um, he fought in Afghanistan on the march to Kandahar with General Roberts. Um, I checked him out and he wasn't there. He was in the Afghan war, but he wasn't on the march. That's a lot of things. So, mm. soldiers' stories. Yes, um, yeah. And I think that's a very good point. Yeah. So, through the Khyber Pass, yes. Yeah, that, that, that section of the film is... 
showing how difficult it is to get to Kafiristan because they they face bandits and then they go through snow and ice and they're pretty much on the verge of death. In fact, they have given up. They come to a point where they realise they cannot cross into Kafiristan. Yes. Um, I was going to say that they come across uh, they come across these two statues. Yeah. Which uh, are kind of the gates into Kafiristan. Yes. They're in the um, Hindu Kush mountains. Uh, harsh snow. Dravet's been snow blinded. He's mm. holding on to their last living mule. Um, and now those two statues are they're authentic. Really. Um, and my research in the Kalash, those are funeral effigies that the Kalash use when someone dies. They make they don't. I don't think they make them now because I think a lot mm. of them get stolen. Yeah. Um, they're really quite ornate wooden carvings. Oh. Um, and they're of their gods and things as well, so mm. they're not just funeral effigies, but those are exactly the kind of thing. Oh, right. Um, the other thing that separated the Kalash and probably the other kafiri, Kafirs mm. from, say, Afghans and Muslims was they had low seats that they sat on instead of sitting on the floor. <laughs> um, things like that. Yeah. Um, uh, anyway, uh, we're getting ahead. So, yes, they they get to a um, an impasse a uh, huge crevice yeah. crevasse yeah. that they can't get over yeah they can't go back because a, a snow bridge they went over yes. has collapsed collapsed yeah so they tell themselves they, they realise they're going to die mm. and in fact they don't want to die by inches he says um, yeah so there's this terrible realisation although they're British so stiff upper lips and they're mm. going to shoot I yeah. guess Peachy's going to shoot Dravot and then himself so they start reminiscing and um, this is my other Afghan war bit. They reminisce about the Highland Infantry at Ali Masjid, <laughs> with the flying with his kilt. Um, there was no Highland Infantry at Ali Masjid, <laughs> and no one won a VC at Ali Masjid. <laughs> right, I've got that off my chest now. Right. <laughs> um, but that is a great scene where yeah. the the Scot. It is a genuinely funny story. The Scotsman loses his money. <laughs> um, goes back after it. The uh, the rest of the soldiers think that he's attacking, so they go with him, and he wins a VC for leading his men. <laughs> it's brilliant, and their laughter causes an avalanche, which fills mm. the crevasse, and on they go. <laughs> which is actually a really important character point, I think, that showing that they're not. It's not just that they're not afraid, but they're quite satisfied with their lives, the life of adventure, and they're saying, "We've done pretty well." Let's go out laughing. Well, they, that, admit, they admit to not being good. Yeah, we haven't done. Yeah. We haven't really left done good in the world, but yeah. we've, we've had we've we've done we've had a full life. <laughs> and it's that laughter in the face of death, which saves them because mm. the, they laugh. There's an avalanche, and that forms enough of a bridge to get them over to Kafiristan. Yes, but of course, another point um, is that quite often you you cross over into another land, another world, fairyland, for instance. It's like death. I've noticed this in like she, for instance. They go Ryder Haggard's she. They enter, uh, which she, is another film we'll be talking about. Oh right, yeah. But I don't. Know, this is in the books. So I don't know if it's in the film. They they go through a tunnel which is completely black, and the main character is suffering from a fever, and it's like a death, you know. And then he comes right, through, right. wakes up again. Yes. And he's in the the fantastic other world. So there's always this point where you cross through gateways. And it's just like death, or just like sleep, because then you're going to oh, dream. Right. Yeah, yeah, that's that's yeah. very interesting. Um, Kipling and ha- Haggard were very good friends. Oh yeah. And um, uh, this Haggard is well known for his Lost World stories, like She, mm. uh, Alan Quatermain, and all that. This is also a classic Lost, although it's not really a fantasy <clears> aspect. <throat> it's a classic Lost World story. Mm. They're going into a lost world uh, that's known about, but no one's from civilization has been there um, and there's even a lost city um, yes um, and so it is that that wonderful classic adventure lost world lost city thing that's very Haggard-esque actually I, I don't know if it's Kipling's most Haggard-like yeah I don't know if he knew Haggard then I, 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 I should have looked that up beforehand though. I think Kipling was at this time in India he was the um, he was the correspondent for the Northern Star. So when he wrote that he was still yeah yeah I think Haggard and Kipling met at a club in London. Although yeah. Kipling obviously he did go back, but um Cause, cause this, so that's probably later. The Man Who Would Be King was collected in a book called The Phantom Rickshaw and Other Eerie Tales, right. <laughs> which I think was one of his earliest books. Oh uh, okay um, yeah short stories. It would have been, yeah yeah I can't remember when she was written, um, but that may have been about eighteen eighty. 
seven actually. Yeah. I'm gonna um, now I've recorded. I've set that on this. Uh, <laughs> I've set that in stone on this recording. I'll we can correct it on the she episode. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um. So yes, they come away from this snowy yeah. mountain, but once they've crossed that, the next thing you see is this. It's lush. It's green. Yeah. There's rivers. There's women, <laughs> um, and then there's the attack. Yes, and this is where their rifles come into play, and yeah. they begin their campaign. Really, isn't yes, it? yeah. Um, you wonder if they've thought this out because they just happen to come across some locals of one city being attacked by locals of another city, and they decide to help out the people who are being attacked, which of is of course. course one way to gain friends. <laughs> yes, I mean they are with their women washing. Yes. So yeah. that's the nat- it would be the natural side, I guess. Yeah. The aggressors. <laughs> They're not going to shoot the the women. And then, of course, having saved, having frightened off the attackers, they go to the city, city of Urheb. Well, they're not exactly welcomed in at first. No, is there a hail of arrows? There, yes, there is, isn't there? Yeah, because they're because they're thought to be demons. Because yes. they've got these. Uh, but then, of course, Billy Fish appears. Yes, brilliant introduction, yeah. of Billy Fish, which we've talked about. Now, this moment reminded me. This is probably slightly irrelevant, but uh, do you know Apocalypse Now? Uh, yes. At the end, they get to the end of the river and they f- they come to the the camp of Colonel Kurtz, and there's Dennis Hopper, who is a, a journalist who's been stranded there. And he acts as a sort of interpreter to right. not interpreting the language, but explaining Kurtz to <laughs> to um, Martin Sheen. Yeah, the Martin Sheen character yeah. has been there, and Billy Fish reminded me of that. Right. You, I think in these films, you or stories, you're always going to have to need an interpreter. Yes. Uh, perhaps more in films because you can't because in a book you can say, "Oh, we spent weeks learning the language. Yes. And we learned this." But in a film, you need someone to explain it. Indeed, that is always a problem with <clears throat> with any of these stories where you go to a strange land. There's going to be a language barrier. Yeah, um, and also someone to explain the culture. Yeah, which is important. Yes, yes. I don't know what languages are being spoken. I think I read something about Billy Fish is actually speaking Hindi or something. Yes, yeah. But the the Kafir, kafirs aren't. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, so anyway, there's some understanding going on there. It doesn't matter. But it's true of border border people who live on borders, or wait, they quite often speak different languages. Oh right, yeah. So I think yeah. that's that's all right. The main thing that reminded me of Dennis Hopper and you know Billy Fish and Dennis Hopper are both quite small people and they dance around. You know, they <laughs> they've got this. They're obviously not. Um, are they jesters? <laughs> yeah, jester types, which and they're is... not. They're not dangerous, which mm. is how they survived. Perhaps they right. fitted in by, by, um, assimilating. Yeah, assimilating into the themselves, culture. becoming useful but yeah. not threatening. Yes. So yeah. it's a sort of ar- archetypal character. I think. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely, and very useful. <laughs> I mean, um, I think that's they need that. I, I would imagine the primary. Yeah. storytelling uh, thing they needed was oh, oh we're going to need someone to translate yes. let's turn Billy Fish <laughs> from in the book the chief who they who Peach and Carnahan give the name Billy Fish yeah um, um, to actually being this Gorka mm. uh, character which is great um, and that's um, the other memorable character I think to, uh, the, he doesn't last that long but Utah yeah. is hilarious <laughs> I just think he's brilliant He's the king of this city, but he's a bit naff. Utah the Terrible, he wants to be called. <laughs> yes. when, they, when, they're, when they're suggesting titles for him. Yeah. <laughs> he's, he's such a great actor on, in this role. Yeah. Um, and so they win over uh, this, this first city. Yeah. And there's a great scene where, I can't remember if it's, I think it's Dravert, is drilling the men. Yeah. And there's one who just can't get it. He puts his it's feet Michael wrong. Caine, actually. Oh, is it Michael Caine? Because I wrote yes. down that this is one of those classic Caine moments. I'm surprised it's not more famous, you know. Right, well, you mean like, don't point that bloody spirit at me. And, and, yeah, and you're and only like... supposed to blow the doors off. <laughs> this is, I think it's another classic <laughs> Caine rant. <laughs> yes. <laughs> He's drilling the soldiers and one is always late. You know, like two seconds late. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now the timing in the British Army has always been one, two, three. One, two, three. You say it again, order one, two, three. Stay after me. One, two, three. In case hot go, one, two, three. Ready, steady, go. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. Yeah. You say at the same time as all the others, right? Don't you say at the same time as all the others? Sabke saath kena chahiye, akele akele nahi. Sabke saath. Right, go. 
One, two, three. One, two, three. Billy, tell him to say it with the others. With the others. One, two, three. Right, now ready, steady, go. One, two, three. Now, you don't say it before the others. He's saying it before the others, Billy. Not before the others, not after the others. With the bloody others. Um, it reminded me of Seven Samurai when Toshiro Mifune's character is trying to drill the villagers. Yeah. And there, there's one that just can't get it. And it is a memorable, <laughs> hilarious scene. He turns yeah. the wrong way. Um, there may even be a similar sort of counting thing, and, and, and all the children are watching and laughing. But this is you know, almost exactly the same scene mm. with, without the children. Um, brilliantly done. And, and the other thing that makes it quite nice... I mean, these are Moroccans, <laughs> and they're not, they're not Indians because it's filmed in Morocco. <laughs> yeah. But he's obviously an extra. Yes. And you can see him actually actually laughing. Like, <laughs> he's genuinely a little bit embarrassed and chuckling, yeah. um, which makes it um, a really endearing scene. I yes, think. yeah. As it is in Seven Samurai, it's, mm. it's, um, it's brilliant. So. And, of course, it would be... They've only got, was it 10 or 20 martini rifles? Um, it's 20, 20 yeah. It? yeah. But it would be the, their disciplining of the soldiers, which is their real advantage over the other cities. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, when you look at the <coughs> Afghan war... Mm. Um, in nearly all the battles, you had hundreds of British against quite often tens of thousands of Afghans, yeah. and the British won you know, 98% of the battles. Yeah. And it was through discipline. Mm. Um, Standing in formation. It was also their yeah. weapons. So the Martini was a um, a much better gun than the Afghan Jazail, mm. which the Jazail, I think, had a longer range, but wasn't as accurate. Mm. And the Martini had a shorter range, but was very accurate. But really, it was the discipline yeah. that did it. I mean, this is true also of Rome, ancient Rome. That's their real power. They moved in these... To, was it tortoise Yeah, uh, yeah. And, the, and the British and square was yeah. the thing that the, the British would form a square um, in battle, as they did at Ali Kel. I think they formed... A number of squares as tens of thousands of Afghans rushed down the hill. Yeah, the British amazingly won that battle thanks to holding their squares. Yeah, at Maiwand, which was the big British disaster, yeah. they didn't hold. Oh. They collapsed, and that was it's amazing. Well, isn't it? another other factors as well, but that yeah, was part yeah. of it. So yeah, they bring discipline to these undisciplined yeah. um, tribesmen, and and suddenly there's a, a little British Empire in miniature yes. is starting to be <laughs> formed. Yeah. <laughs> And of course, after one of the funny things in the films is that every, they go to a city and they say, "Right, who who are your worst enemies?" And the worst enemies are always the people who piss in the river. That's hilarious. <laughs> I love the way they. That's the first lot. Yeah. They, um, Utah's saying they piss downstream, and, and then <laughs> they go to the next lot. And they, who are your enemies? Oh, they're up there. They piss downstream to our river. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. So funny. Really good. And of course, we get our first lesson really in. In fact, actually, just as you were talking about Utah, the leader of the first city, I just realised his his story is almost like a the, a miniature version of that of Danny Dravitz, because of course Utah isn't really ma made out to be a king. He's no. not meant to be a king, but he's given the opportunity to be one, and he immediately assumes the title Utah the Terrible. Yes. And when they conquer the next city, he walks in and starts executing people as though he had a right to. Yeah, well, he's about to. Anyway. Yeah. So yeah. in other words, he, he trumps himself up. And of course, what happens? He Is he the first person whose head gets cut off and used to play polo? Well, no, we didn't we... Because the the Peachy and Carnahan... Uh, Peachy and Dravet capture one of the soldiers' yes. uh, tribesmen at the river. Yeah. They take him to Utah, who gives... And they give him to the women. Yeah. And the next time we see him is yeah. his head on the polo field. Beautiful. So then that's foreshadows when we see who, you know, whose head are they using this time. It's yeah. Utah's. Yeah. So Utah trumps himself up and gets knocked down pretty hard. Right, right. Interesting. Just, yeah, yeah, yeah. The Dravets. What happens yeah. to Dravet later? Yeah. There's a lesson. <laughs> 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 yes, I have to remember that. Um... Yeah, well, the next thing of note is they've, um, once Utah's men are, are trained and they go to the next city, Dravet gets shot with an mm. arrow that mm. goes into his um, um, bandolier, is that yes, the word? Yes, bandolier, yeah. Um, and he takes, when he takes it out, there's no blood. Yes. And this starts spreading the rumour that he's perhaps not human. Yes. Um, is, a, is a god. <laughs> yeah. 
uh, which is of course sets the sets, yeah. sets the stage for the his fate really. Yeah. And really, their conquering of Kafiristan is is pretty quick. I mean, obviously, it's it's foreshortened the film. It's not an interesting part of the film really, but they do basically go from city to city, conquering each one and. Um, yeah. Always taking half the treasure, they say, divide yes. your treasure into two portions and we'll decide which we have. Yes, that's, that's quite a good way of doing it, actually. I thought, when you said that, I thought, oh, that's quite clever, because then yes. they, they don't know which half they're going to have. So. <laughs> yes, I must remember that for when I um, go and try and take over a, 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 a nation. <laughs> of course, another moment that's important is just before the first battle, some monks walk across and oh, everyone course. stops. Yeah. And that's actually quite a... Um, an affecting moment, I thought. Yeah. You realise just how powerful their religious feelings are, you know, these people in this country. Yes. Um, for some reason that reminded me of another film, and I may have got this completely wrong. I'm going to check this later and find that I have got it completely wrong. There's a 1969, I think, Chinese film called A Touch of Zen. Have you yes. ever seen that? that? I think that reminded me of it. Yeah. It's got this line of uh, monks, are they blind? I think they might be blind rather than their eyes closed. And yeah. I can't remember, does that stop a fight as well? Yeah. That's why I can't it's quite remember. It's a vague memory, but yeah, it did anyway, remind me of that. Similar kind of yeah. thing. Um, no, no connection to this film, really. Yeah. Just uh, a reminding thing. So, yes. Um, and then, of course, Danny Dravitz <laughs> sees Roxanne. Of course, yes, that's the next thing. Which is, well, so really, they've got to the height. They've taken over the country. They've got to the height of their powers as, hmm. as soldiers. People are coming and giving <clears throat> treasure, gifts... And Danny has been set up as a king, uh, as a god, really. Yep. Yeah. Um, and he sees Roxanne, and of course. Um, well, he asks her name, Roxanne. Yes. The way she said it made me think: Is that her name? No. Oh. Or, or is she saying that because she kind of? Yeah. I don't know the way she said it, but she might not be. It might be just her acting style. Because of course, Roxanne was the wife that Alexander took when he came to Kafiristan. Yes. Yeah. And so the, we're, it's being set up that Danny is another Alexander, or Secunda, mm. as yes. they call him. Yes, Secunda. Iskander is Arabic for Alexander. Oh. And, um, yeah, well, we'll get to Alexandria later. So this is the start of the downfall. Danny says there's no harm in looking yeah. <laughs> at uh, Roxanne. Yes. Obviously, there's thoughts. <laughs> um, and at that same thing, they're approached by the monks. Yes. Um, the priests. And he's told to come to Iskandigal. Uh, Iskandigal. Yeah. Sikandigal. Yeah. And this um, is putting him in his place, because he's, at that point, he's pretty used to being a god now. <laughs> and he's saying, they're requesting me to come? No, they're telling you to come. Yeah. <laughs> so That's true. The, yeah. the, there's no... They don't necessarily believe he's a god. <laughs> mm. They obviously um, want proof. Yeah. So off they go to this lost city. And we see it in long shot, mm. and there's this hill, and there is this Greek temple, this white mm. temple on a red rock city. Um, a wonderful, that's a matte painting oh, right. effect done by quite a famous um, painter called Albert Whitlock. Oh. Um, and in fact, in the, I was going to mention some of the matte paintings in the mountain yeah. scene as well, the bridge, their matte paintings. Oh, I suppose they would be, yeah. You know, where. Um, <laughs> I think they're painted on glass mm. and you leave a gap where the film goes yes, and then the yeah. rest is painting yeah. amazingly seamless yeah I first heard of them when I'm just being nostalgic now <sighs> Return of the Jedi had come out we were in America oh yes yeah. do you remember Dad used to <laughs> go and see a chiropractor in Hollywood Boulevard yes and we were left to wander Hollywood Boulevard yes. which is quite an experience and I went to a bookshop and I saw this Ralph Macquarie yes was he the artist yeah um Portfolio, and I spent some dollars on it, probably uh -huh. a huge number of dollars. Uh, but he was, I think he did matte paintings, yes. for it, and I learned about it then. So, an amazing effect. Mm. They're almost see in the film, they're pretty much seamless. I, mean, yeah. I think you can see when you look, you can see a little bit of juddering sometimes, maybe. Mm. But that painting of the Lost City is fantastic. Yeah. Uh, you may even think, oh, I wonder where they filmed that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but it's, it's, paint it's a painting. Yeah. Uh, but it is a Lost City, mm. and here we are. This is very exciting, I think. You're, this was a city built by Alexander in 328 BC um, when they go in the city there's Greek statues mm. um, there's columns that have fallen down um, and of course now now what happens he's 
they want to claim they want to um, they want to test his claim test his to claim. be a god so they're going to fire an arrow at him that yeah first? yes well he doesn't realize he, he goes up and says okay right test me what's gonna happen yeah they grab him they and then they're gonna fire an arrow at him to see if he bleeds yes because they um, well then he struggles then they grab him yeah um well peachy knocks the arrow out of the way the scuffles they get him so now they're going to stab him yeah. and that's when they see kipling's um uh, this, watch fob yeah the masonic symbol and um, which is then they sh- do they lift up the stone yeah well then the priest goes over and sa- he's the only, the priest the high priest is the only one who knows this symbol yes he goes over to it's, it's like a stone chest that's right they lift up the top in yeah. the book it's I think it's the throne that Dravet's sitting on. Oh, yeah. And he, as I say, he puts on his um, overall, <laughs> his dungarees, <laughs> his overall <laughs> with the Masonic symbol on. And all the priests go mad and they think, oh, the game's up. But actually, what they, they then push the throne over and underneath, they wipe oh, away the dirt. Oh, underneath oh. is the Masonic symbol. Yeah, in this one, it's, um, it's a, they remove yeah. the top of a stone. And yeah. it is. That high priest, by the way, oh, yes. like 103 years old in that film. He was a really? local Moroccan. I think he was the caretaker for a, a, a local orchard. <laughs> and Houston, John Houston saw him. Yeah, he's definitely and got the look for a high priest. He said, he said come, you know, be in the film. And um, when he came, turned up for work, he kept falling asleep. He was so tired. <laughs> and he said, no, you don't understand. You can now give up your old job. Because he was uh, continuing his night watchman of the orchard oh. job. <laughs> so about 103. Yeah. Brilliant. Uh, really good. And you feel that... So yes. he has is one as Dravet says when he thanks the long line of priests that mm. have down the ages kept the treasure yeah. <laughs> for them. And that scene where the Masonic symbol is um, revealed and everyone recognises Danny Dravet for what they think he is mm. is occurs quite in quite a lot of these Lost World films in various ways. I think I might be stretching a point here, but um, I noticed like. Obviously, in King Kong, there's the point where they see Fay Ray, <laughs> and ever all the natives stop. Yeah. Um, there's also a point in the Golden Voyage of Sinbad, which we're going to discuss later, where the, blo- the bloke with the golden mask. Yes. I think he takes his mask off or something, and there's a bunch of, of natives stop what they're doing. There's this moment of recognition, which occurs quite often. It's not always true yeah. recognition. Right. It's sometimes, um, as in this, it's. A fo- you know, a false recognition, as it were, but it seems to happen in quite a lot of these films. Yes, yeah. Um, I mean, there's, there's. It's interesting the religious aspect mm. of this, perhaps that it's a, it's a belief that it doesn't take much. It's quite a precarious link between reality and belief. Yes, it doesn't take much for them to be convinced because these beliefs are so ingrained in their culture. I mean, mm. obviously, over two thousand years, they've been waiting mm. for Alexander's son yeah. to return yeah. uh, or to to appear to them. Um, they're almost looking for. I think that's a very strong thing about religion. You're looking for things yes. to support it. Yeah. As soon as something comes, yes, this is it. Yeah. But it's very easy to topple. Yeah. Um, and in fact, the, the priest is quite sceptical. I think he's also actually seems to be looking. Which yes. I kind of respect him for. Yeah. He's looking for something to um, perhaps give the lie to it. Or, yeah. Although he's he actually does he's easily convinced. Once he's convinced, he's totally for them. But he gives them the treasure. So yeah. That's a sign of that. I think. Because the the other example I I, I was going to say is the moment in She, which we're going to come to later, obviously <laughs> when Aisha or Asha recognises the reincarnation of her Roman love. Yeah, there's another moment where you you know everything stops and they recognise. Yes, yeah. I'm um, going back on the religious thing again. Dravot later says he starts adding th- things up. He starts to believe his own hype. Yes. Um. He says, look, look. You know the the the. I, why was I given that? Watch mm. it all adds up. It's fate. Yeah. Which is a common thing that people who want to believe things do is they look back and add up things that have already happened to get them to where they are. Yeah. Um, uh, when actually, of course, those things just happened, and that's where you are. Yeah. Um, it's very. It's a pattern seeking thing, but he falls into that trap. Yeah. And and starts to believe no. This is, was meant to be. I am. I am. Yes. Am I Alexander's son? I think that's what's probably going through his head. There's more to this than meets the eye. It all adds up. 
What does? Everything that's happened from the time we decided to come here. Now, before that, beginning with your taking Brother Kipling's watch, more than chance has been at work here. More than mere chance. Why his watch and not somebody else's? And what made him give me the emblem? One thing after the other. The avalanche. The arrow. The mark on the stone. And not to mention another Roxanne. Roxanne? The Venus de Marla. The same. One more thing is needful for my destiny to be fulfilled. That I take her to wife. For God's sake, leave the women alone. Who's talking of women? I said wife. A queen to breed a king's son for the king. What about the contract? The contract only lasted until such time as we was kings. And king I've been these months past. The first king here since Alexander. The first to wear his crown in 2200 and... 14. 14 years. Him. And now me. Yeah, and that is, of course, the moment when he's really lost yeah. to us. He, he says, you call it luck, I call it destiny. Yeah. And he starts treating, he starts treating Peachy. He says, you know, maybe you should bow. You know, when there are other people present, maybe you should bow to me. Yeah, yeah, that's and, a bit earlier, isn't it? Yeah. Um, but, and you think, yeah, that's when the contract's being broken up, really, because yeah. the friendship, as you say, they're one, one person, one character. Yeah. It's being broken up. You know? Yes. And, of course, the thing that really does it is he decides yeah. he wants Roxanne as yeah. his wife. Um, in the book, there's no Roxanne. No. Um, a wife is chosen for him. He decides to take. he, mm. he should have a wife, and the the the, 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 the kafirs choose one for him yeah in this one of course we've got he wants he remembers her and wants her yeah um and that's breaking the contract and that's where it all goes yeah horribly wrong uh, there's one moment before that which really impressed me which is when they uh peachy and um i've forgotten his name danny dravitt get to see the treasure they're given because and i was watching it and i realized you don't actually as a viewer you don't get to see a lot of treasure what you get to see is their faces. Right. And you really think they've, they've been gobstruck yeah. by the sight of this treasure. And you know that they, they've already taken half of the treasure of each city they've conquered. Of course, but yes. But here they're flawed. And the only thing that one says is, it ain't brass, Danny. Yeah. And you think, <laughs> I really believed in the value of the treasure because yes. of how, of the acting, basically. Oh, there is a wonderful bit where he picks up this enormous ruby. Yes. He says, look at the size of that ruby. It's, it's almost like Crocodile Dundee. Yeah. That's not a ruby. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he gets this even yeah. bigger one. Yeah, great. I mean, I don't know where all that treasure came from and why it was left by Alexander in the... Well, I guess he'd been conquering an awful lot of cities and he just yeah. needed somewhere to I mean, you see it. the swords. There's kind yes. of uh, Greco-Roman swords or whatever mm. there. Um... So yeah, um, there's a scene where Dravet's going to get married the next day and there's the wailing in the night because um, when a god marries a mortal, yeah. um, she burns up and disappears into yeah. a puff of smoke. And Peachy tries one more time to say, you know, let's quit while we're ahead, yeah. like, come with me. And they're divided by this bead curtain. <clears throat> so they're, they're physically divided, uh, but they, they are divided yeah. at that point. That's that's the definite barrier, mm. and yeah, you know, Dravet says no, and the other John Huston film we're doing, Treasure of the Sierra Madre, which I think is the next one we're going to talk about. Um, it's greed. Mm. It's now for Dravet. He's not. He's not. He's gone past the treasure. He's now greedy with power. He yes. believes he's the god of these people. He's got there, but he's just taking. Yeah, you know, Peachy says, "Let's quit while we're ahead. Let's yeah. take it and go." Um but he wants more and that's the same as in Treasure of the Sierra Madre um, yeah they should have quit while they are ahead but mm. unfortunately greed yeah. that's a story of greed oh really nice um, and it's a similar yeah a similar thing similar sort of lesson yeah so of course what happens is um, Danny Dravitt gets married and as soon as she come, as soon as Roxanne is brought she seems to be in a drugged state or she could be just so tired from a night of wailing and being I think she's scared. I think she's in total shock and yeah. and you know on the edge of fainting yeah. by the looks of it so anyway she bites him yeah. and he bleeds yeah. and of course this is the moment where he proves that he's human yes but the whole point is that he's 
started to pretend that he's not human that he's a god so it brings him back down to earth as well um, yeah. I did I did always think they say oh, you can't marry you won't be able to um, consummate the marriage because you're a god yeah and I always thought this is the point where you say I'm a god I'm going to become human for one night or something yeah. you could have got away with it <laughs> yes <laughs> yeah it's almost like he's adopted the role and he has to stick by its rules. Yes. Uh, yeah. But, uh, yeah. And everything falls apart. That's when they have to run for it. <laughs> yes. Well, they march out like good British soldiers. Yeah. Um, and then they do have a few faithful uh, yeah. tribesmen with them. And in fact, in the book, that's Billy Fish is 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 the tribe uh, leader. He's still there. He's he, still with them. With yeah. them. And yeah, Billy Fish in the film, the Gurkha uh, flies off into the masses and. St- dies yeah um and um yeah we've got a, a kind of a, another a scene that also reminds me of another film um when dravit goes off to the, the bridge and they start hacking away yes. again i always <laughs> thought if he'd have ran if he'd have run across the bridge he'd have probably had time to make it the amount of time they took to yeah hack the ropes away um which reminded me uh, a bit of indiana jones and the temple of doom yes. <laughs> yeah um and he plummets into you know, an endless chasm. <laughs> yes, yes. It took him half an hour to fall. Beachy oh, later says. Of course, they must have, because they get his head, don't they? Yeah. They get his head back at the end. Yeah, of it. yeah. And uh, Peach is nailed to a tree. Crucified. Crucified. Yeah. yeah. And he's only let go because they thought it was a miracle he survived a day. Mm. So off he goes, and he manages. To he c- says he took a year to get back. I think, but yeah. again, as you say, his time could be. Um, may may not be accurate. But then again, it's quite likely it took him a year mm. to get back, to be honest. So he gets back to tell the tale. Yes. Which is true of all tragedies. I, I seem to remember reading about Shakespearean tragedy. That always at the end, there's someone there who knows the full story and can tell it. That's an important part of it. Yes, yeah. Uh, again, in the book, Kipling goes after Peachy the, uh, the next day, I think, to try and find him. And he's been put into an asylum. And oh. then he dies the next day. Um, in the film, he just goes off, doesn't he? Yeah, we don't yeah. know his fate. Yeah. Um, so that's basically the story. Um, there's one thing we were talking about adventure. What make what is an adventure story? Last yeah. time, and one thing I felt while watching this film is um, really it's a kind of an exploration of humans. Yeah. Um, it's the quest to sort of discover yourself and your limits and what you're capable of, but sort of in a mirrored in a geographical quest yeah the geographical quest mir- mirrors the quest for understanding of you know, the human condition or yeah. whatever yeah um it's really so you can get stories that are just about the inner life mm. of characters this is really kind of putting it into a very physical mm. environment and sort of it's the test of skill strength courage yes uh, all these films um they're very much boys' own adventures. I mean, this is quite a male-dominated set of ten films. Yes, here. yeah. Uh, now, I'm I am male, um, <laughs> so and I'm biased towards the kind of things I want. So, um, I think also it's wrong to say this is sexist. Yeah. Because everything can't be everything. Yeah. Um, these are boys' own adventures. Um, you know, anyone is free to enjoy them. Yeah. There's there's other things that are girls' own adventures, if you <laughs> like. And again, everyone's free to enjoy them. You know, let's not start mm. calling these sexist films in any way. Yeah, I, I think. yeah, I don't think there is. I mean, obviously, because it's historically and accurate. You can call them sexist <laughs> to some degree um, if they treat women characters, yes. and and which quite to be fair, they do. Yeah, quite often, um, uh, women are not important. Yeah. Uh, we're seeing Lawrence of Arabia yeah. as one of these films. Famously, there's only one female in that film, which is one of the camels. <laughs> <Really>? <laughs> um, I don't know if that's true, but I think it is. Well, no. um, is it? I'm, I'm trying to think now if I can remember. But that that is one of the famous yeah. stories of that film. But of course, in Islamic society, I suppose I don't know. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah yes. Um, um, so women are not fairly represented in, the, in these mm. ten films, apart from definitely at least one. We'll be looking at Hidden Fortress, which I think has got a very good. Mm, female character yes, yeah. anyway that's getting ahead <laughs> um, so yeah I was really just just trying to sort of sum up the adventure yeah of this film and yeah. I think I think that's it it's a map it's a geographical map mm. of 
the human quest mm. in a way. Mm. Yeah, for me, the adventure lies in the feeling of the freedom the characters feel to make themselves one step better than they are. They're working class, they think we could be kings. Yes. But of course, being kings, they then go one step further and become gods, or one of them becomes a god, which is, that's when you're brought down, you know, there's a feeling that... Which is a very British thing, actually, because even today, we love we love people who work themselves up from nothing to get to a place... But um, yeah. if, people, if people go too far, then, yeah. and this is um, is, is not really, a, it's not a personal thing. It's a tabloid I don't mind it. thing. Really. It's a tabloid thing. Yeah. The tabloids will not, you know, oh, that, that person's gone too far, right? We're going to cut them down. Yeah. Don't get above your station. Yes. Uh, you know, Dravet here has got above his station. It's, it's. Um, I don't think that exists in America. You, you no. There is no getting above your station. The American dream is, you know. You can do it. Yeah. Go for it. Uh, in Britain, you know, the, there's real support for someone. There's amazing the underdog, support yeah. for the underdog. Um, but when you get to the top and then you start going too far, which is a natural thing. I mean, this is the this is the thing that man never learns, yeah. if you like. Yeah. Um, once you get it all, you know, kind of remembering where you've come from, mm. keeping your feet on the ground, um, going too far and downfall. I mean, that's a lot of these things. The story is the Sierra Madre. It's... Um, Man who would be king. Yeah. Uh, many other stories are, are are the downfall of of just not accepting yeah. your lot or not quitting <laughs> while the going's there, good. There was a a king in ancient history, and it might even be Alexander, who had a slave whose one job was to stand by him and whisper, "Remember, thou art mortal." Oh yes. I don't um, know, was that Alexander? I'm not sure it was. Uh, what, what's the memento mori is the Latin phrase yeah. it's all a lot of graves remember that remember, yes, you're, mortal. Yeah, remember yeah. you're mortal yeah maybe uh, that's that's well, the lesson <laughs> that's it that's yeah. it um, have we got anything else to say about this um, no. we, when we talk about the Masonic I don't really know a lot about the Masons but that's a no. very strong part of it Kipling was a Mason mm. um, I mean that's the uniting factor yes. all the way through this film is this brotherhood yeah. aspect um, it unites Kipling with Dravet and Peachy yeah. Carnahan um, it, it unites um, uh, Dravet and Carnahan with the Kafirs yeah. and with Alexander so you know mm. and, and I mean it comes supposed to come from the builders of Solomon's Temple yeah. the Masons yeah um, so that's that's the running thing and that's the same in the book um, I think in the book I might be getting this wrong remembering it but I think Dravet he claims they're the sons of Alexander rather than um, the priests or, or rather the Kafirs saying oh you must be the son of Alexander oh, returned right. he says because this is one thing about the um, the Kalash what makes them different from their fellow Northwest Indians, mm. um, which is now Pakistan, is a lot of them are very fair skinned and even have blonde hair, especially when they're young, really? and blue eyes. Yeah, and so there is this. Uh, a lot of people believe that the the Kalasha are descendant of um, Alexander, and mm. the same with the Kif- in Kafiristan. Yeah, so that's a real historical thing. It's possible. I think most people, apart from the the Greeks, mm. who fund, are really keeping the Kalasha going. Oh. They fund a lot of their building projects and, and are, are really the ones keeping them, their culture alive, uh, financing it anyway, because they they believe that they are their cousins. Yes. Um, I know um, Alexander was Macedonian. Yeah. Um, and in the book, uh, Dravet notices, you know, he, he pretty much saying, these are, these are our brothers, they're white. You know they're fair. No, they're really. fair skinned. <laughs> they're not the same as the Afghans and the Indians. Yeah. Um, and that's true when you look at them. They are. Mm. But I think it's 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 generally accepted amongst unbiased um, anthropologists or whatever that there may be other factors mm. involved rather than. But there's the strongest story. If you look on the internet, for instance. Most people accept um, that the idea that the Kalasha certainly are descended from. Alexander yeah. stories and I used that in the Rainbow Orchid as well when I read more deeply into it I thought oh, maybe that's not maybe I have believed um, s- propaganda mm. really yeah. there may be truth in it there yeah. probably isn't who knows <laughs> um, there could be there could mm. be 
but certainly that's that's the truth. So again, there's this the, there's this slightly uncomfortable. You know, no <clears throat> white man has been there. Yeah. Um, and oh look, they're they're that they're like us. They're white people. Mm. Again, with she, it's in Africa, but there's a white queen. Yeah. You know? <laughs> um, so there's that whole aspect of it, which um, yeah, uh, is is a bit old fashioned, shall we say? Um, but yes, I think we've pretty much. Yeah. The man who would be king. It's an excellent film, I thought. I really enjoyed it. Yes, yeah. yeah. You'd seen it before? Yeah, I saw it at school. Oh, you mentioned that, <laughs> yes, yes. What I age would that have been? Well, that was uh, 10 or 11. Right. I can't even remember. I remember we were given some photocopied sheets, which might have been the whole story or part of it, probably. So it wasn't a, it. like a school film club, was it? No. Was it part of, like, using Kipling or. I really can't remember much. I know it was in It was Q. in lesson. Oh, it was Q, in Q, yeah. which is stands for inquiry, is it, is it which Mr. was just Mr. Mr. Perry. Oh, okay, not Mr. Butler. No. That's who I had for Q. No. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I can't really remember the context of it. There's a few films like that. Like, I, I saw an ad- adaptation of Dracula, which I still like. Oh, which one? In English. It was a, a BBC right. one from 1977. Oh. And I think... Yeah, why did I see it? You know, I can't remember what we, how we were studying it, or what link it was to learning anything. But I remember seeing it. The only two films I remember seeing at school were, you know, this was, was a film club, and I can't remember if it was primary or secondary. But one of them was one of our dinosaurs is missing, and the other one was Bonnie and Clyde. Mm. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah. Well, I've, I mean, I actually watched it about uh, well earlier this year. Mm. Um, I watched it last year when I was researching Rainbow Orchid stuff just because I was interested in the Kalasha yeah. and I thought oh I wonder how they've I was trying to I spent ages trying to work out what the Kalasha would have worn in the 1920s <laughs> um, which is such an obscure difficult thing to find out yeah. but I think I've got my best guess sorted out but it involved looking at oh I wonder what they did in The Man Who Would Be King oh. um, and it was completely different yeah. kind of uh and that's when I got into Robertson as well. I bought his book to see what he said about it. Right. But again, he wasn't really talking about the Kalasha. He was more in Kafiristan than Chitral. Um, so I've seen it. That's probably the maybe the fifth or sixth time I've seen mm. it. But it's a long-standing favourite, definitely. Mm. And uh, if you've listened to this, we've totally ruined the plot for you and you haven't seen it. Um, I mean, even so, it's such a well-made film. John Huston is rightly mm. uh, known as a brilliant director. Um, it's beautifully shot, brilliant as you said earlier, brilliantly acted. Mm. Uh, yeah, a great yeah. film. <laughs> yes. So I'm just going to check, but the next film, yes, the next film we're doing is The Treasure of the Sierra Madre from 1948. So an earlier John Houston film, black and white, western, set in Mexico, I think. Mm. And um, have yeah. you seen that before? I'm pretty sure I haven't seen it. I have. I mean, when we lived, we shared a house quite a few years ago. I had it on video. Yeah. I don't know if I inflicted it upon you or not. That's the thing. I've got a vague memory of deciding to watch it, but then I can't actually remember what the film's about. So I might recognise it when we see right. it. Right. Yeah. I mean, I I only bought. I've been trying to get it on DVD for a while, but I think it's only been available as part of a box set. Mm. Uh, but I eventually caved in and bought this Humphrey Bogart <laughs> box set. Four great films. Yeah. Um, um, but that's the only way I could get Treasure of the Sierra Madre. Mm. Um, but definitely worth it. So we'll be doing that next. Yes. So uh, thank you very much for listening. Um, if you've got any comments um, or you'd like to correct any factual inaccuracies, <laughs> please do, um, politely. Um, um, hopefully there'll be somewhere to leave uh, There'll be somewhere to leave comments or you can email. Um, this will... Um, be available uh, actually to be honest after this this podcast we're, we're sorting out a website for these for King Kong to go up first um, but it'll be available on my blog which is webbledygook.co.uk and Murray has a blog yeah I'll link to it uh, through murrayewing.co.uk slash musings so we'll put all these links um, wherever this podcast appears hopefully these links will be there for you to click and check out our stuff Um, Thank you very much for listening. See you next time. Bye.